Is there a more controversial or divisive figure in all of Berserk than Griffith? The man was introduced as a gleaming white falcon whose charisma was so magnetic that we ignored the literal red flag hanging around his neck and acted all shocked and betrayed when he ended up doing the inevitable. Claiming that Griffith's tale is that of a tragic hero is a great way to spark a heated debate within the Berserk community. And saying that he did nothing wrong will probably spark riots depending on which part of the internet you're posting that kind of speech on, but we're not here to address that pile of nuclear excrement. If you guys want to know about the reasons behind Griffith's transformation into demonic Hawkman, we suggest that you check out our Berserk playlist, which has a number of videos delving deep into Kentaro Miura's beloved franchise. This video is going to be talking about what changed in Griffith as a consequence of his ascendance in a rather literal fashion, as the title might have given away. So, without further ado, this is Femto's Anatomy Explored. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. Even as a human, he had a striking physique, but he was human nonetheless. Griffith's anatomy as Griffith. We're going to be referring to the subject of this video by two different names, so we can understand that it might be a bit confusing for newer viewers, but hey, blame Miura sensei He's the one who introduced the guy with two different monikers. We knew that Griffith would turn into Demonic Hawkman all the way back in the Black Swordsman arc, because that's how he was introduced to the series. After his bloody, bone-crushing encounter with the Slug Count, Guts ended up getting pulled into an interstice with the guy thanks to the former's behelet and came face to face with the guy who had seemingly spurred on his entire revenge campaign against the monstrous apostles. The God Hand referred to this person as Femto, but Guts kept calling him Griffith because that's what his name was before he became this. But how did he end up becoming a Hellraiser cosplayer? Well, that has a lot to do with his human life and the decisions he made within it. If you want to know more about all those things, we'd once again suggest that you go check out our Griffith Origins video because we break it all down in disgusting detail over there. But to sum it up in one sentence, at his lowest point in life, Griffith craved power. And he got it in the form of a demon angel whose visor will give you nightmares. But that visor used to stand for something more noble when he was still a man because it resembles the helmet that the former White Falcon would wear into battle as the leader of his undefeated mercenary band. As a human being, Griffith was a man of great ego and desire. He was a commoner with not a trace of royal blood within him, yet he desired to grasp the throne for himself with his own two hands. Many of the things that he manages to accomplish, even as just a human, are completely insane, which is part of the reason why his rise through the ranks ruffled so many feathers at the Midland Royal Court during the Golden Age arc. Griffith was an unparalleled strategist and psychological genius. Guts learned this during his first deployment with the Band of the Falcon, where Griffith managed to seemingly account for everything imaginable under the sun, leading to a night raid that he himself deemed to be a near-perfect success. That is extremely high praise coming from a guy who has been warring his entire life and has likely embarked on many a raid even in his short 16-year-old lifespan. Griffith's crowning military achievement would come three years after this, as he manages to take control of the impregnable Doldry Fortress with nothing but his personal mercenary band, whereas the armies of Midland had failed for decades before him. His ingenuity can also make him very ruthless, as he was able to deduce who his enemies were at court and then stamp them out very quickly, all because Minister Foss looked at him a certain way. He was also aware that he had to keep his mind honed to the edge of perfection if he wanted to succeed in becoming king given his commoner status, so Griffith kept himself educated on a vast array of topics and was a regular philosopher whenever he needed to be one. And sure, the brain is technically a part of the human anatomy, and Griffith is, in Dr. Kevin Costner's words, an exceptional soft and more moist specimen, but what's even more impressive is his physique. Back in the medieval days, what you saw was what you got. Ugliness was often taken as a sign of one's commonality, and appearances were not just a sign of nobility, they could also further your status quite a bit. Griffith was an exceptionally beautiful man, even when he wasn't being powered by demon essence, which we'll get to in just a bit. He had curly, flowing silver locks that fell way past his shoulders, and a chiseled face that made every lady of the realm swoon over him regardless of whether they were nobility or not. He has a face that looks almost tender and ladylike, with sharp, full features, and Griffith is very aware of the effect his appearance has on people. He uses his beauty and charm to put the moves on the royal princess, Charlotte, to great effect, and ends up seducing her largely thanks to how he looks. Heck, she even says that she found it hard to believe he was a commoner because of the way he looked, so that portion of his anatomy is pretty well covered. But being smart and looking amazing aren't enough to keep a friggin' mercenary company in line because usually, 
pretty boys like him are either gutted for their silver or violated by the company's men, or something even worse. What kept him at the top of the command chain was his mastery of the sword, which, when he first met Guts, was on par with him. In fact, it actually might have even surpassed him, and that's all down to Griffith's anatomy. He was a lithe, flexible individual who preferred to fight on horseback with a saber, a weapon whose efficacy depends on its handling more so than craftsmanship. Griffith was able to use his saber to deal multiple fast cuts to Guts during his first proper one-on-one, -on -one because of how built he was and the training he had done to perfect his skills. He might not have looked it, but Griffith was jacked and toned out the gills. He kept his body lean, but that was because of the fluid fighting style that he preferred. During that first encounter with Guts, Griffith managed to casually avoid a direct attack from Guts's two-handed sword by jumping onto it, which is sheer insanity and we don't need to tell you that. This one move was enough for us to realize that when it came to fighting, Griffith did have the goods to match the sales pitch. But that truth became more and more falsified as Griffith kept working on achieving his dream, because the closer he got to becoming king, the further he got from actual fighting. And while it might have kept his brain sharp, it absolutely absolutely ruined any kind of fighting experience or body muscle he had built up during his campaign. Once you become a statesman, keeping yourself as sharp as your best soldier is just not practical. But Griffith never thought about that when Guts asked him for his own freedom. He was absolutely confident in his abilities when facing Guts that fateful morning in the snow, even after acknowledging the latter's growth as a warrior, when reality snapped his sword in twain. Guts had only recently survived a one-man stand against a hundred Tudor knights. He had performed miraculous feats of his own during his time as a falcon, and had become a peerless warrior during the time Griffith was busy playing politics. When Guts broke Griffith's sword in half in one fell swoop and left him kneeling in the snow, he broke Griffith's spirit and mind unknowingly. The fact that he had lost to someone he thought he owned shattered Griffith's seemingly strong self-confidence and exposed it as being frail as a thin wafer biscuit. He ended up sleeping with Princess Charlotte after this, got caught, and was thrown into a torture dungeon by the King of Midland for a year for his flagrant transgression. And to be honest, everything the Tower of Rebirth's jailer did to Griffith was actually his fault. He couldn't control his emotions and they got the best of him, to say the least. He also taunted his tormentor, which is never a good idea, and it ended in his body being put through literal hell before he allowed it to take hold of his soul. But this torture also formed the basis for his transformation into Femto, as Griffith was broken down and stripped bare to the world in a ghastly and literal fashion. The Exposed Flesh of an Insane Man How the Fallen Falcon's Anatomy Paved the Path for His Demonic Transformation While Griffith always had a malicious and greedy side to him, which was seen whenever Miura would draw his eyes more hawkishly, what we think cemented those traits as his overt personality was the year-long torture he went through. Now, if even a single thing that the King of Midland's torture did to Griffith happened to us, we'd have probably given up on life after day one. But perhaps it was his insane resilience to torture that ended up driving him completely insane. When Griffith was first imprisoned, his torment was kept simple. He was lashed many times by the King of Midland, and that was seemingly going to be that until he brought up the King's attraction towards his own daughter. Griffith sealed his fate with that comment, and thus began a year of torment that even he ended up acknowledging as having shattered his sanity. When Guts and Co. find Griffith lying in the bottom cell of the Tower of Rebirth, he might as well have been dead. His entire body is covered in lesions from the multiple lashings he had taken over the course of his imprisonment, but that's child's play compared to the rest of his injuries. Griffith's body has been flayed, and his musculature exposed by his torturer at multiple points, including his torso, his back, his thighs, and even his face, which we don't actually get to see in the manga, but they did a mock-up of it for the Golden Age movies, and Harrowing doesn't even cover it. His nails have been ripped out, his tongue removed, his arm and leg tendons cut, so he can't even make any physical movements that count as physical movements. The jailer used every implement of torture that you can imagine. Hot irons, boiling water, you name it, Griffith felt it. He even implies that he might have violated Griffith because the jailer says he was also the one who nursed Griffith to health after torturing him, and that they were like husband and wife for the past year. And he even grossly licks Griffith's tongue while recounting all these horrors to his rescue party because to him, it's a token of their relationship. But what's even more terrifyingly impressive is the fact that after all of this, Griffith was still alive and could think for himself, even though his thoughts were now consumed by his obsession with realizing his dream. For Griffith, 
alive. His entire life had been geared towards achieving one thing, and that was the throne. In the state his body was in now, there was no chance he was going to achieve that dream, and he was well aware of it. Yet that dream, and the thought of guts in his mind, is what kept him from succumbing to his wounds throughout his year-long imprisonment. Whenever Griffith would think about how worthless everything he was being subjected to was in the grand scheme of things, two images would flash in his mind and he would question everything all over again but with a renewed, though spiteful, interest in life. That of the castle he's been chasing since he was a kid, and guts. But it's very clear that although he can think for himself, his mind is broken, because Griffith ends up calling guts both the reason he's alive and the reason he's being tortured as well. We know that sleeping with Princess Charlotte wasn't something anyone forced him to do. Griffith did that to reassert his dominance over someone in order to make himself feel good about the loss of his best soldier. But, in his twist tortured mind, somehow it was Guts' fault he was in this position. And it was while he was ruminating on his regrets that we got the first hint of an upcoming supernatural transformation for him. Nosferatu, Zod, and Skull Knight had warned Guts of an upcoming ritual called the Eclipse that would change his world for the worse, and that Griffith would be at the center of it all. But we hadn't seen Griffith himself become aware of this until chapter 41. As he lie in his cell broken and numb, Griffith saw a brick fall out of his cell wall. In H.P. Lovecraft stories, madness wasn't looked at as just a mental illness, it was also seen as a sign that someone was particularly sensitive to otherworldly beings. Many of his characters that end up going insane also end up becoming vessels for terrifying cosmic entities like Cthulhu or Nier Lethotep. In short, literature often likes to portray madness as a sign of something more nefarious than a broken mind, and the same is true in Berserk. From that section of the wall where the brick fell out of emerges at least a dozen twisted souls that call out to Griffith with the one word he had always wanted to hear applied to himself, Prince. He then sees the silhouettes of his future kinsmen, who tell him that his chosen time approaches and call him the Blessed King of Longing. Though he doesn't even know whether his own thoughts are real or not, that image of the four members of the God Hand sticks in Griffith's mind, and we should have honestly guessed that things were going to get real messed up during the eclipse. Even after being rescued by the people he had known his entire life, Griffith could not shake the feeling that he had been robbed of what was rightfully his. He looked at Guts, with both tenderness and jealousy, but the latter feeling became stronger as Griffith realized just how far he had let his authority over his people slip from his now dysfunctional hands. He also ends up being exposed as an invalid to his men, and gets rejected by the one person he thought was incapable of rejecting his advances, Casca. After being bombarded with so many nasty truths all at once, Griffith realizes that he will either chase his childhood dream with no inhibitions, or he'll die trying. Even in his crippled state, his head is clear enough for him to commandeer a wagon by himself, gripping the horsewhip with his teeth and doing his damnedest not to fall off. But fall off he does, as the wagon hits a rock and sends him flying into a lake west of the border of Midland. As soon as he lands, Griffith breaks an arm, which completes his descent into madness. He starts laugh crying and tries to kill himself, and even that fails. He then starts despair crying and wants to give up the world in exchange for the power that will allow him to live the life he always wanted to live for himself. And this is when his Crimson Behelet decides to return to him. If you want to know more about that, check out our Crimson Behelet origin video. But it is with the activation of the Behelet that we finally arrive at the subject of our video. Once Griffith's inner malice towards Guts and the world at large and his desperate desire for obtaining his kingdom flow into and mingle with the Behelet thanks to his blood, space itself is cleaved open and an interstice is summoned, triggering the fifth eclipse. After this, Griffith ceases to exist. What emerges is his idealized version of himself and and that's who we're here to talk about. The crystallization of one man's ambition leads to the deaths of thousands. The anatomy of Femto, the fifth god hand. When Griffith first arrives in the interstice of the eclipse, he's confused and most likely just as scared as his companions at the sight of the scores of apostles and the demonic looking god hand. But gradually, through the mental manipulation of Ubik, the sage advice of Void, and his own personal recommitment to realizing the dream by any means necessary, Griffith comes to realize that his true place is actually amongst these demons. When Void addresses him as the blessed king of longing, he recalls the fever dream moment he had at the lowest point in his life, and he feels like he belongs. And by the time he ends up saying the words necessary for getting the ritual going, we too come to the disturbing realization that yes, Griffith is actually 
actually a demon in Falcon's feathers and not a tortured tragic hero. That's because during Ubik's mental manipulation, there is a moment of acknowledgement where Griffith realizes that everything that was happening was because of him. Standing in a field of corpses as his child self, he realizes that he had been letting people die for him all his life, and that the only thing that kept him going was that shining castle in his mind's eye. That's all that mattered to him too, and the only one that made him forget about it was Guts. So he decides to cut off everything that had defined his life up until that point, and chants the necessary words for turning the entire Band of the Falcon into sacrifices for demon kind. When that happens, Griffith's body is clasped in a fist by the God Hand altar he was kneeling upon, and we see his physical self starting to mutate within a cocoon-like shell. His face starts morphing into what we can only call a dark version of Garuda from Hindu mythology, while his digits start turning into talons and his back starts sprouting wings. Meanwhile, his astral self, aka his soul, descends into the deepest recess of the astral world where it arrives at the center of the abyss and meets with the only confirmed god in Berserk, the idea of evil. There, the two have a conversation about life, particularly Griffith's, how humanity willed the idea into existence, and how it repays that favor by keeping the evil karmic spiral rolling forward into the future. The idea tells Griffith to do as he wills, and take a form he feels would be suitable for accomplishing the task he needs to accomplish. At that moment, Griffith says he wants wings, and ends up flying off to the surface. We don't see his new form in this chapter. In fact, we don't even see this conversation because chapter 83 has been deleted from Berserk canon. But the talk about life, death, and fate isn't why all this is relevant to our video. The moment Griffith made the decision to sacrifice his comrades, his astral body sort of became linked to theirs. Because he was sinking towards the abyss, he felt all their deaths pierce through him. The creation of a god hand is rather different from the creation of an apostle. Apostles are usually required to only give up that which defines their humanity, which is usually limited to a couple of people, like parents, or at best three, like Grunbeld's friends. In the case of god hand members, the sacrifices needed to ascend are far greater, and therefore far more terrible. In the case of Griffith, he sacrificed the entirety of the Band of the Falcon, which was at least 200 strong by our estimate. Those of them that got devoured by the apostles had their souls sent to the abyss, which in turn sent them into Griffith's astral body. Meanwhile, the blood spilled by their slaughter was collected by the face dimension of the eclipse and sent into the close-fisted god hand, which directed all of it to Griffith's cocoon. At this very point, his astral body flew its way back to his physical body, and the point of convergence between the blood of the sacrifices and Griffith's soul reaching his new vessel caused a sanguine explosion. From which emerged the fifth god hand member, Femto. As the wings of darkness, the fifth demon king, and the blessed king of longing, Femto is one of the strongest beings in all of Berserk. Anatomically, he's everything Griffith probably imagined his ideal self would look like. In his human life, he died frail and flayed and even before that he wasn't a particularly bulky individual. Femto is built out the gills with rippling muscles and a permanent six pack that's part of his skin, which itself looks like exo armor. His arms and legs are all muscle too, reminiscent of the exposed musculature that had become his reality for a year before this transformation. The digits on his hands turned into talon-like fingers that were probably so sharp they'd draw blood with a prick, and the ones on his feet turned into actual talons. Across his back extends a robe that actually doubles as the wings he asked for earlier, making him look like a Batman-Hawkman hybrid when he flies. But the most recognizable feature of his entire being that tells you that this man used to be Griffith is his face. At the time of his death, Griffith was wearing a torture mask that was made to mock his trademark falcon helmet. All his life, whenever he would go to war, he would don that helmet and aim for victory no matter the cost. At his lowest point in life, it became the only thing that reminded him of the man he used to know, and now it was a permanent part of his anatomy. Femto's head is exactly the same as it looked at the time of Griffith's death. It has the falcon helmet fused to the god hand member's face, which makes him look like Griffith with his visor permanently down. The two key differences in his facial features are his lips, which were darker and more goth in their design, and his eyes. As a man, Griffith had beautiful falcon-like eyes with round irises. In the 1997 anime, they were a lovely shade of lilac as well, but as Femto, his round irises gain a diamond-like flare, which is a signifier of his true demonic nature. And all of his newfound muscles aren't just for show either. Though we haven't seen Femto go hand to hand with anyone in the series, we're sure that's only because he doesn't need to. For you see, he can manipulate 
space itself. Yup, that's right. As a God Hand member, Femto has natural command over every apostle in existence, because that's how instinctively subservient they are to their guardian angels. At the time of his birth, every apostle in attendance stopped their maniacal feast and bowed their heads in reverence to him. They then proceeded to obey his every command without him saying a word, which just goes to show you the amount of power afforded to him by his natural anatomy. Even if an apostle goes against him ideologically, like Emperor Ganeshka, when they enter his vicinity, they cannot help but feel a natural sense of salvation and reverence. The Dread Emperor described it as maddening, and that's an appropriate term for it in our opinion. Now, coming to his spatial powers, Vemto can manipulate pretty much anything that enters a small radius around him. It is unclear how big this radius is, but it must be at least a few good meters, because for his first act of spatial manipulation, he was able to turn a few apostles in front of him into a ball of meat and blood. But his aim wasn't good enough because he was going for Skull Knight. Or rather, Skull Knight was just too fast for him at this point. During the Black Swordsman arc, Femto gains enough control over his powers to tank cannon fire without hesitation and toy with guts using his powers as opposed to struggling to even comprehend them. As a God Hand member, his very presence causes life-threatening pain to those bearing the brand of sacrifice. But that is something only Guts and Casca need worry about. The rest of the cast needs to worry about his very presence, because following his incarnation into the physical world, Femto becomes the definition of absolute. Using his spatial manipulation powers, he can move the very clouds in the sky and nothing can touch him. Not a hail of arrows or Guts as Dragon Slayer. Femto was a beautiful man even as Griffith, but following his physical incarnation, his beauty becomes literally magnetic. He has the same effects on human beings that he has on apostles, and that's probably due to the incarnation ceremony where, much like the Eclipse, Femto absorbed the souls and blood of thousands gathered in St. Albion to force his rebirth into the physical world in Griffith's mortal flesh. He has also refined his abilities to the point where he can live up to his namesake. A Femto second is a measure of time used only when things go real fast. And we mean the human eye can't even see it kind of fast. Well, that was his reaction time to Skull Knight atop Shiva's head, because he manipulated that sort of actuation slash before Skull Knight could even say anything clever. And these days, he's too busy being Berserk Jesus, casually communing with dead souls and leading humanity to a new golden age through a world of darkness of his own creation. But the two things that remind us that Femto is a demon through and through are his eyes and his heart. Even after coming back to life as the beautiful White Falcon, Femto's eyes still have that demonic flair. It's the only physical feature of his that reminds us that he's a demon. But what's interesting is his heart. At the time of his ascendance, the idea of evil told him that his human heart had been frozen, and he would no longer feel unnecessary emotions that would impede his conquest. Femto confirmed this when he visited Guts at the Hill of Swords, and realized he felt nothing after seeing his former comrades, Guts and Rickert. But when he saw Casca, he felt an instinctive urge to protect her. He saved her from a rock slide and departed the scene with Zod, thinking to himself that his heart was beating when it should have been frozen. This is because at the time of his incarnation into the physical world, Femto absorbed something part human, Guts in Casca's demon child. The demon child, despite being a product of Femto's first malicious act as a god hand, was a human seed mutated by evil in the end and it manifests through Femto's body every full moon as the Moonlight Boy. We don't know if the Moonlight Boy is killable yet, but he appears to be the only time when Femto is truly helpless. Other than this Achilles heel, he has the perfect anatomy that any human looks for in a savior, and that's a big part of why he's being seen as such by the humans of Berserk at this very moment. But trust us when we say, one day he will end up being exposed for his crimes, and when that day comes, nothing will save him, not even his near-perfect anatomy. Marvelous Verdict. But as for this video, that's gonna have to be it. Let us know what you thought about it in the comments down below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Until then, keep struggling, strugglers.